Madam Minister, uh, important dignitaries uh, and political leaders present here today, and political activists, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to address this symposium in honor of Barbara Prammer. Barbara Prammer was a truly inspirational leader, a great woman, and a passionate advocate for gender equality. And given her lifelong commitment to enhancing women's participation in important decisions, in political decision making, I think it's very appropriate that the symposium is focusing on the issues of refugees and solidarity. As we have heard, there are over 60 million refugees and displaced persons in the world today. That is about eight times the population of Austria. One million asylum seekers arrived in Europe last year, already some 15,000 in the first month of 2016. I'm told 100,000 asylum seekers arrived here in Austria. Over half the world's refugee population is composed of women and girls, and very often they bear the brunt of human suffering. So looking at the refugee problem through gender lens is critical if we are to turn chaos into coherence, compassion into concrete action. The figures are worrying, the stories and pictures are deeply moving. It is arguably the biggest humanitarian challenge that Europe has faced in recent years. I was working with UNHCR, leading the emergency team in Kosovo in the late 90s. And since then, I believe this is the biggest refugee problem that Europe has faced. But it is also a political challenge. And I fear that we are at a very dangerous turning point. If the right political choices are not made, years of gain for women in terms of human rights, as well as socioeconomic development, could be jeopardized. The refugee crisis is symptomatic of a bigger crisis of values. My thesis is twofold. The plight, the suffering of refugee women hides a bigger challenge for human rights and gender equality. How Europe responds to the refugee crisis, how Europe upholds its human rights values can have enormous impact on peace and development, not just in Europe, but around the world. Women, refugees, and solidarity are deeply linked. The International Development Law Organization, IDLO, which I now have the honor to lead, is the world's only multilateral organization exclusively devoted to promoting the rule of law. Austria is a member party of IDLO. The rule of law promotes good governance, and so it is an essential ingredient of sustainable development. A core principle of the rule of law is equality and equal protection. <clears throat> Everyone is equal in the eyes of the law. Everyone is equal, equally accountable to the law. Unfortunately, for millions of women and girls in the world, the, this world is a very unequal and unfair place. Laws and institutions often not only fail to protect women, they actually actively discriminate against women. In too many countries of the world, laws and institutions restrict women's rights and freedoms and subjugate them to their husbands, fathers, brothers, or sons, including on such fundamental issues as what women can own or might inherit, whom women might marry or divorce, women's relations with their own young children, what control women have over their own bodies, where they may go with whom, and even what they can and cannot wear. Where gender, gender discrimination is widespread, gender-based violence thrives. So my first point is that any discussion on refugees, refugee women in particular, must take into account the inequality and vulnerability which women suffer in their countries of origin. We cannot effectively protect refugee women if we are not ready to combat gender discrimination globally. And I quote from Barbara Prummer, who said, it is not enough to try to eliminate gender gaps. 
One has to transform the structural factors that underpin the persistence of gender inequalities, gender-based violence, discrimination, and unequal development progress between men and women. What she said in 2013 is as true today. It took the UN only three years to draft the convention to eliminate racial discrimination. It took the UN 13 years to draft the convention for the elimination of discrimination, sorry, for the, to eliminate racial discrimination and 13 years to adopt the convention on the elimination of discrimination against women. So you see, fighting racial discrimination seems to be easier than fighting gender discrimination. There was tremendous global solidarity against racial apartheid in South Africa, which segregated people on the basis of their color. Where is the solidarity against countries that promote gender apartheid? Can we talk about solidarity with refugees without also showing solidarity for gender equality? Sexual terror on the streets of Cologne was a reminder of the sexual terror perpetrated against Egyptian women in Tahrir Square and against many women in many countries of the world, including my own. I was once a victim of precisely that kind of sexual terror in a public place. We need global protests against local attacks. Any woman's dignity and safety should be every woman's, and I would say every man's, concern. My second point is that while the plight of women does not begin with refugee status, being a refugee brings additional and significant dangers to women. We have heard the minister talk about the <clears throat> number of women who have suffered sexual violence while making their trip uh, to Europe. Rape as a weapon of war has been documented in many conflicts. During flight and in refugee camps or during exile, women and girls continue to be exposed to the risk of rape, sexual assault, harassment, exploitation, by, not only by traffickers and smugglers, even by soldiers and rebels, unscrupulous camp officials, police and immigration officers, and even by their own communities, men in their own families and in their communities. But even as we are horrified by such stories, let us remember that only 19% of the refugees coming to Europe recently have been women. Most of the world's refugee women are still living in their own regions, in refugee camps or communities where they continue to face very serious protection problems. In addition to sexual violence, they face racist attacks, high levels of crime, domestic violence. They cannot get justice for the wrongs committed against them. The police often don't listen to them. And camp justice systems are usually run by men. Women don't have the money, the education or the legal awareness or legal aid to seek justice in formal courts. They may lack identity papers. And protection challenges are interconnected. A failure to address one issue can perpetuate others. High levels of physical insecurity, for example, in refugee camps can induce underage marriage as a way for parents to safeguard their daughters. Inferior and overcrowded shelters can create health problems, provoke domestic violence, or expose women to risk of sexual abuse. The lack of adequate sanitary materials can cause health problems, but also force girls to miss school and women to be absent from work. Although we know that education and employment are the ways in which women can improve their situation. Solidarity towards women means that we need to both support refugee women who are coming to Europe, as well as helping those <coughs> who have chosen to remain nearer their home countries. Now, neither Austria nor Europe is, of course, a stranger to receiving refugees. If we look only at relatively recent times, in 1956, 180,000 Hungarians fled to Austria. In 1968, 160,000 Czechs and Slovaks found safety in Austria. In 1980, when martial law was declared in Poland, 33,000 refugees arrived in Austria. With the beginning of the war in the Balkans, 13,000 refugees fled from Croatia to Austria in 1991. And in 1992, the first of the 90,000 refugees
from Bosnia started arriving here. And in 1991, when the conflict in Kosovo escalated, Austria accepted more than 5,000 refugees on a temporary basis. For a country the size of Austria, these are not insignificant numbers. So what is different about the current refugee problem? I would say first, the fact that the refugees are coming from outside Europe. They are largely Muslim Arabs and raise questions of cultural integration and security as was noted by previous speakers. And especially in the wake of the Paris attacks and the New Year's Eve incidents in Cologne and other European cities. But there is also, of course, a deeper political problem, and that is there is no European solidarity at the political level, no shared strategy, much, le uh, much internal fighting among members, and ad hoc and inadequate policy making. Europe's most cherished achievement, freedom of movement within its borders, has come under pressure. Trust among member states is at an all-time low. And there is a dangerous shift in public opinion, especially after Cologne. The appeal to European values and moral duties has not been consistent. On the one hand, operations to rescue people have been strengthened. On the other hand, haphazard land border controls have been imposed, shifting the problem from one country to another. The European common asylum system has failed to respond to the urgent need for burden sharing adequately. And just about every European state, whether on the frontier, in transit, or as the destination country of asylum seekers, feels that it has been disproportionately burdened. The redistribution of refugees are, has clearly, at least in terms of figures, is clearly inadequate to the problem, and in practice, uh, very few num numbers have actually moved. So now, the focus has shifted to tackling smugglers and supporting neighboring countries of asylum and transit. But critics have pointed out the weakness of the strategy. Unless action against smugglers is accompanied by some relaxation of legal means by which refugees and asylum seekers can arrive in Europe, it will not deter those who are desperate to move. UNHCR says that in 2015, last year, it needed about 967,000 places, almost a million places for resettlement. European countries have offered only 22,000. European countries could be more flexible and generous with humanitarian visa regime. Furthermore, the European EU-wide rules and family reunification could also be relaxed. They currently define family as a nuclear family, although we know that precisely from the cultures that we have been talking about, unmarried daughters, unmarried sisters, elderly mothers are, part of, are seen as being part of the nuclear family. Slow or insufficient resettlement quotas and restrictions on family reunion by European countries are counterproductive for vulnerable women stranded in refugee camps. Some human rights groups have also expressed concern about the agreements between the European Union and first asylum or transit countries, neighboring countries. The fear is that these countries may prevent refugees from Iraq or Syria to enter and Europe may be tempted to turn its eyes the other way. What this refugee crisis has clearly shown is that the European refugee system is broken and must be fixed. Ultimately, the answer lies in more effective schemes for sharing responsibilities for reception, decision-making, and solutions, as well as, a, as well as a protection-sensitive border control system and expanding opportunities for legal migration of refugees. My third point is about strengthening development as a means of preventing and resolving refugee flows. We all know that conflict and political insecurity are the biggest obstacles to development, but they are also the root causes for refugee problems. The World Bank reports have repeatedly made the point that no post-conflict country has been able to achieve a single millennium development goal over the past 15 years. When schools and hospitals are destroyed by shelling, 
when education and health systems break down, when food becomes scarce and jobs are lost because investors flee, destitution and displacement become entrenched, who suffers the most? Women and children. Successful peace-building strategies need investment in institution building, including transparent and accountable justice systems. This is what IDLO, my organization, is doing in Afghanistan, Myanmar, Ukraine, Tunisia, Somalia, South Sudan, Central Asia, West Africa. Our work of building institutions is complemented by our work to increase access to justice, especially for women, especially for victims of gender-based violence. As the newly appointed UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, recently said, international protection of refugees must be account accompanied with safe and durable solutions to refugee problems. And that means investing in development. That brings me to another disturbing trend in Europe by which some governments are using their development aid funds to pay for the cost of asylum seekers arriving in their country. This is like robbing Peter to pay Paul. It is short-sighted because it uses money that is meant to deal with causes to address symptoms. The rationale for development aid is to help poorer countries become more resilient and stable with stronger institutions and economies so that their citizens will be deterred from migration. Of course it is true that development aid is not always well used and is sometimes frittered away through corruption and mismanagement. But the answer is not to reduce aid, it is to take tougher action against corruption and make more effort for better management of aid funds to improve and enhance its use and impact. The more donor governments are willing to invest in developing social and economic uh, development, in promoting the rule of law, the less they will have to scramble and spend to address catastrophic failures that the refugee crisis represent. Building resilient societies takes vision, it takes time, and it takes money, but it is the best investment to address refugee problems. And my fourth and final point is about the empowerment of refugee women. It is too easy to see women, especially refugee women, as victims in need of protection. Yes, they need protection, but they are agents of change and agents of their own destiny. I worked for UNHCR for 21 years, and I spent much of my time in refugee camps. And I remember vividly today a situation in, in the 90s when I was on the border of the Naf River, which separates Bangladesh from Myanmar. And refugees were crossing that river, and I was on the Bangladesh side at the refugee camp waiting to receive them. And I saw these families coming across, exhausted, tired. They would come across the river. The men would sit down under the tree and start flapping their scarves and resting. The women would start looking for firewood. They would go get water. They would light a fire, and they would start cooking food for the children. They would start putting uh, the little plastic sheeting that UNHCR was giving to build their tents, and they would be soon uh, trying to get their family together. I have never seen refugee women in any refugee camp rest unless it was very late in the evening. That says a lot about the resilience of women, with no disrespect to the few men in the room here. And I think Barbara Palmer would have understood that because she had a similar kind of resilience. Now, some years ago, UNHCR launched what they called Dialogues with Refugee Women. And they talked to thousands, hundreds of refugee women around the world. I have myself participated both during the time I was with UNHCR and later with Amnesty International, and even now, wherever I go, I speak to women, refugee women, other women. And if I ask them, what do you need? they usually point to three things. Education, employment, and space for leadership. They want to be in control of their own destinies. And they have usually very good ideas, their own ideas, about how to get there. And it is up to us to listen to them, to support them, and 
to help them participate. Earlier, uh, we heard about the importance of women's participation, and I cannot stress it more. There is a Security Council, a UN Security Council resolution, 1325, 1325, which promotes on women, peace, and security, and it calls for women's participation in peace negotiations, in post-conflict reconstruction, in humanitarian relief, and peace building. But women, very few women, are actually at the political table. They're usually in the corridors, campaigning, lobbying to be heard. And I think it is time that we need to bring, it is time those women were brought to the negotiation table. Gender empowerment helps women to organize, and we know that if there is one single factor that has helped women around the world, whether in Europe, Asia, Latin America, that has helped women fight and gain their rights, it has been the ability to organize themselves. Women's organization is key to women's empowerment. We all have heard about the gender dividend of de development. Invest in women, and you invest in future generations. That's what the World Bank says. It says that's smart economics. Empowering women and girls is smart politics. I'm sure if Barbara Pramer was here with us today, that's what she would say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene, for sharing this precious speech with us, with all the numbers and all the thoughts and all of your experience, of course, a lifetime experience with the issue of empowering women and also be their partner if it comes to flee and flight and being a refugee. Um, you mentioned in your speech that there have been various situations where the Austrians and the society and the system has faced refugees to come. It was the Hungarian crisis, everyone knows the crisis in, in the Czechoslovakian system, and of course Poland, and of course there were the Balkan Wars. But you mentioned now refugees come from outside Europe, and we have questions of cultural identity, and different religion. So what would your suggest be from your perspective and also your experience, how to deal with that difference? I think you raised a very, very important issue about um, the clash of cultures. Now, I come from one culture. I have traveled, I've lived, I've grown up in another. I'm married to a German, actually. But I believe I'm a Muslim. So you can see, I can see in my own life how things are changing and how each of us, on the one hand, are being forced to become global citizens, but at the same time, we are very much part of our local cultures. And this is precisely what is happening. Uh, in the past, uh, you didn't have uh, the possibility for people to travel long distances. Uh, but now, of course, people do. And so we get refugees coming, and Europe, I think the geography of Europe is a challenge for Europe. You are surrounded. Uh, east and South, uh, with other countries from other cultures, with different kinds of values. Uh, but this is not the first time uh, this has happened. This is the history of Europe. The history of Europe has been uh, the, the conflict and, uh, 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 and the interaction between uh, European civilization and other civilizations. And I think that is what's happening here now. We have very powerful tools today that we did not have in the past before to bridge the gaps. And I would say technology is in our favor. We can learn more about each other. I see, I come from Bangladesh. I was there just a few weeks ago during the holiday season. And I saw how in the villages, in the remote villages, people now have television, they have internet, they have mobile technology. And they are communicating, they are learning, they are seeing. The very fact that you're getting these refugees coming to Europe is because they can see on their internet and in their mobile phones and uh, through in, uh, information technology what life is like in Europe, and that's 
the kind of life they want, and that is why they're coming here. We need to use those same techniques to also learn to share values. And as I said, the root causes of gender inequality lies in the customs, cultures, laws, processes, procedures uh, that are still discriminating against women, that are still encouraging uh, violence against women. We need to address those through education and through information, through dialogue. Uh, and dialogue does not mean compromise. It means understanding ways in which we can influence each other. And we need to influence. When you think about conservative cultures, what is happening, for example, with terrorist groups, how they're grabbing the minds of young men in Europe. Why can't we go the other way around and grab the minds of young men in other parts of the world about liberal values? I think education and information technology are the key to changing these problems. Thank you very much for sharing that thought with us. So grabbing the ways technology offers us today for better reasons than to uh, motivate young men to go to war or support them in their structure of a society with weak women inside. Uh, I was very touched when I read the story first and now uh, have heard it again. Um, you sharing with us the moment where you were watching um, people flying just uh, over the, sorry, fleeting over the, over uh, the river and the man just sitting down in the next possibility of shadow and relaxing and the women starting to prepare the uh, support for their families. So this exceptional strength of women, which is obvious in so many causes, not only if we're talking about uh, these very, very strong situations. What can societies and international organizations do to support women in their strength, but not leaving them alone in their fight against what they have to fight for? So what are there some, some well, landmarks that might be ahead? Um, you know, about, uh, I don't know, about tw uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, produced its development report, its first development report on gender, on women. And it actually measured the hours that women work and men work every day and found that in every country in the world, if you take a formal work in the formal economy as well as work in the informal economy at home, looking after children and so on, women work longer hours than men except one country. <laughs> that was Denmark. But in every other country in the world, women work many more hours. Uh, so what refugee women do is actually a natural part of the way in which social uh, relations are established. It may ch change. Perhaps it is already changing as younger men are actually doing things that men were not doing in the past. And I hope uh, that in the next generation it will be a different world. But by doing what we do, we have created a strength in ourselves. And as I said earlier, think about the past 100 years in Europe and think about how women from the time of the suffragettes managed to get the vote, got their political power, got the social power, how they organized themselves and changed the world. I come from Bangladesh, which is known for its microcredit movement. And as you know, uh, one of the, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to women, to a women's organization called Grameen Bank, because women, illiterate, uneducated village women, had managed to figure out a way in which they could get capital, borrow money, and be able to change themselves. I could tell you hundreds of stories from my own country about how women are changing their lives and the lives of their children and the lives of the future generation. The future of the country could be a very different one from what it is now. So I think what we need to do is to give women that space, that recognition, I know that Barbara Prummer was a great believer in quotas, and she saw quotas actually as a way of breaking the barriers. Now, that's a controversial issue. It may or may not work in every situation. But what I think works in every situation is listening to women, listening to those who are part of a problem. Very often, 
gives you insight into what the solution is. Listen to women and give them the resources and do not be afraid to experiment. Fail, but fail fast. And women will learn and do it again. It's like when you give birth to a child. It's your first child. You've never done it before, but you manage fine. <laughs> so there are many, many things like that in our lives that we never do. We try it. And I think it's having confidence and trust in women. And women need to have confidence and trust in themselves. Very often I find that it's women themselves who hold themselves back. And they will say, oh, I'm not ready for it yet. I can't do it. Usually, you know, I, I, as a head of an organization, interview a lot of people to hire them. I have never found a man who says, I can't do the job. <laughs> I find plenty of women who feel, oh, I'm not ready for it. Maybe I can't do the job. I think it comes naturally in us, and it's building confidence, and building confidence in girls, in the younger, you know, in the younger generation. <laughs> Thank you, Irene, again. question. We have noticed women inside this room laughing at the one or the other point. Just for a last uh, question, if we go back to strengthening the self-confidence of women, what is it we as European countries, cultures, uh, citizens can do to strengthen that self-confidence in their so-called home countries or based countries? Is there anything particular you might share with us? Um, I think I would say respect. Uh, I say respect because, you know, when I was head of Amnesty International, uh, we had a program in Bahrain uh, for training women politicians uh, to prepare them for parliament <coughs> parliamentary elections. And the thing that they appreciated most was that we didn't come to lecture them. They knew that there were many cultural barriers that they had, many traditions and customs that they had that one would find unacceptable for political women political leaders in the West. And they were not ready to be revolutionaries and change that overnight. So they wanted us to respect their views and work at their pace. Take it, understand them, understand the environment in which they live. It is not about fighting men and creating a revolution. It's about learning to live with men and influencing and changing the other side. So I think respect is something that would be very, very important. And I feel here as well, not just when we're helping them far away. That and then local ownership. It's their problem. We are working, my organization now is working in Afghanistan where we have helped to develop the largest shelter network for women victims. We are also right now developing a network for legal aid providers. And in both of the situations, what we are doing is we are facilitating. We are there, we give them the space, we bring in whatever knowledge, whatever skills they need, but we let them talk. We let them organize themselves. They go at it perhaps slower than we would, but it is more lasting. And therefore, respect and local ownership, understanding the different cultures live with each other. Integration is very challenging, uh, but colonization or imperialism is much worse. <laughs> and uh, we all know that that has happened. You know, there are cultures from the south that have also uh, occupied other, other places, so it is not just something between the west and the rest. It's something that happens everywhere. But understanding and appreciating and listening, uh, I think is very important. And providing, and the people, women, want to know what's happening elsewhere in the world. They want to learn from other women. So again, I would say interaction, uh, dialogue, learning about each other, talking is important. Let me just end with one thing from my time when I was with Amnesty International. You know, with UNHCR, I was working for an organization that provided some concrete assistance. So wherever we went, we were able to give them tents, we were able to give them food, we were able to give them something. When I started with Amnesty International, it was an advocacy organization. I would go to different parts of the world and I would listen to women victims, uh, victims of human rights abuse, and there was nothing we could offer them. Nothing. Concrete. Yes, we could go and say we will lobby and we will advocate this and that, but very unlikely that that particular person would benefit from it because it's not immediate change. 
And so I would wonder, why would people come? People, women walked miles in Zimbabwe to come and talk to me. Women came out of the camps in Darfur to talk to me. And I asked them, I said, why do you come? Because I feel so inadequate, there is nothing we can give you. And they said, it is so important for us to know that there are people in other parts of the world who care. It is so important for us to have you just listen to us. So I think that is also important, the solidarity that, that you have as the theme of this conference. Knowing that there is solidarity matters a lot to those who are struggling. Thank you very much, Irene Khan. Thank you very much. It's your applause.